I'm Meda Malik Hussain and you're watching The Coffee Table. And you know, as always, we love to have these medical shows and I'm really excited about this one because I will get to ask lots of, you know, massively nerdy genetics related questions because I find it fascinating. And I'm not going to give a very long introduction about it because I want the two doctors who are joining me today to tell you about this. So today we're going to be talking about thalassemia and thalassemia in Pakistan. And I remember in the 90s when I was you know, much younger, uh, there used to be a lot of um, awareness in initiatives about thalassemia and somehow we don't seem to be having those conversations anymore. So today's show is going to be sort of a, a fun-filled and fairly detailed exploration into the disease. <laughs> so I am delighted today to be welcoming with me on set Dr. Hassan Shahiyar, who is a medical oncologist and a hematologist, which means he is a blood doctor too. He specializes in the treatment of blood disorders and cancers and is also the head of medical oncology at Shaukat Khan Memorial Hospital. And and joining us is Dr. Adil Akhtar, who works with the Indus Health Network. He is a pediatrician who has also been on the Medical Advisory Board of the Thalassemia Federation of Pakistan since 2005 and is a diplomat of the American Board of Pediatrics. Welcome to the show, doctors. Thank you. Thank I'm you. very excited. So are we. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. We're like, Yahoo! We're going to be talking about all the interesting things. So I like to sort of, you know, begin at the beginning. So, um, Dr. Shahia, tell me, what is thalassemia? Okay, first of all, thank you for having me on your show. Thank you for taking out um, the time. <laughs> and uh, I'll try to be as simplistic and explanatory as possible for your okay, audience. Cool. So thalassemia essentially is a disorder of the red cells. Okay. And uh, in red cells, particularly about a protein uh, mm -hmm. iron complex called hemoglobin. Yes. So we are all endowed with a uh, with a hemoglobin, which ha which is composed of four alpha globin mm -hmm. chains and two beta globin chains. Right. So these globins are those protein chains, and they align in a certain ratio hmm. to have a stability to the structure. Yeah. Now, if there is any deficiency in these chains hmm. or there is any defect, um, the structure will not be stable, hmm. and it will crystallize or precipitate in the red cell, right. uh, leading to the death of the red cell, and it will just split asunder. Oh, it just explodes. It basically. explodes in the blood or in the <clears throat> bone marrow, and it causes all sorts of problems. Um, oh. And the biggest problem is that you don't have oxygen carrying uh, this compound. Hmm. Um, so these patients become um, hypoxic, and then all the complications are related to this feedback of this hypoxia towards the body hmm. and the resulting, uh, you know, complications. Whoa, so what's hypoxia? Sorry, so hypoxia is basically lack of oxygen. So okay. uh, when you don't have hemoglobin, which is functional, hmm. then you're not binding oxygen and releasing it yes. to the other tissues. So so that means your body is not sensing oxygen from the lungs yeah. to the tissues. And naturally, if the body doesn't have oxygen circulating around it, then that leads to all sorts of problems because right. all cells need oxygen to live. Correct. Biology. <laughs> okay, so we have um, we have the alpha and then we have the beta chains. And from what I understand, then that means that there are two kinds of thalassemia also. Tell us, yeah. doctor. So um, if you have a deficiency of your alpha chains, yeah. it's alpha thalassemia. Mm. And if you have a deficiency of your beta chains, yeah. it's beta thalassemia. Mm. So... Um, but just taking it a step further, um, there's uh, uh, terminology which people use as, uh, which is an old terminology now, but uh, it used to be called thalassemia major. Yes. Uh, thalassemia intermedia mm -hmm. and then thalassemia minor. Mm -hmm. So thalassemia minor, uh, everyone in their body has two genes. Yes. Right? Um, if one of the genes is affected and one is normal, the normal one sort of dominates. Mm -hmm. And so it takes over the whole function of your red blood cells and you don't have uh, a deficiency of mm -hmm. your beta chain. Mm -hmm. uh, if both are affected, then you have a possibility of having a deficiency right. of your beta chain. And Which would so, be major? No, not necessarily. Oh, okay. So it may be major or intermediate. Oh, okay. Right? Hmm. Uh, now, what decides whether it's major hmm. or it's intermediate? And that is actually the severity of the disease. Hmm. So it's mainly the clinical presentation of the severity of the disease. Hmm. And not to get too complicated, but now they've uh, changed the whole major and intermediate uh, category into whether it's transfusion dependent, uh -huh. thalassemia, or it's non-transfusion dependent thalassemia. Oh, okay. And just to make things more complex, like yes. biology <laughs> usually is, is you can have concomitant alpha thalassemia 
in addition to beta thalassemia. Which means you can have both. You can have both, which will just come up with a whole new picture. <laughs> and, then there's, and then there's not just alpha chains and beta chains, there's gamma chains. Right. Goodness, I did not know about <laughs> gamma chains. You right. sprung but, them on me. Yeah, but, but, uh, but uh, I mean, we can go into a lot more complexities, but right. just to keep it simple, uh, the, the, uh, in order to decide about the severity of the disease, it's really about how much blood the child needs to survive. And we're talking about children because it, you, thalassemia usually presents at around six months of age. Ah, and I want um, to kind of come back to that. But I want to know more about gamma chains now because now it's out there. So <laughs> now I must know. <laughs> well, so, yeah, so the two commonest chains are the alpha and beta yeah. chains. But, you know, there are different types of hemoglobins. Like we have a fetal hemoglobin, yes. which is predominant during the fetus uh, time frame of the, mm. of the mm. person. Uh, so, so they are composed of a different chain. So that's where the gamma chain right. chain comes. And just to add more complexity, there are actually <laughs> more chains than Amazing. There's, there's, yeah, there's epsilon, there's zeta, you know. Wow, so it's like so, half the Greek alphabet right. is like so right there. The, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So so but we are mostly familiar with the alpha and beta for most of our patients. Because that's the most common kind well, that, of mutation. Right. Well, uh, yeah, the alpha and beta chains are actually your adult. Hemoglobin. Right. So oh, okay. adult hemoglobin, all of us have alpha and beta mm. chains. Mm. Uh, children, when they're born, uh, babies, newborn babies, mm. they would have um, alpha and gamma chains. Oh, interesting. And then there's a transition huh. to what an adult should have at around three to six months of age. Huh. And if it's and that's where the beta chains start coming in, right? And and and, uh, and na the, nature hmm. is just so perfect. Huh. Um, if you think about it, the reason why the baby has those um, gamma chains it, it is so is so that it can pull oxygen from the mother. Wow! So it has a greater ah. affinity of oxygen. Right. But Ooh. now, once the baby is in this Out normal air, in the world, in huh? the world, now it doesn't need to be a parasite anymore, <laughs> for that matter. <laughs> and, and now it can actually just uh, t be just like us. And then gamma should ordinarily then kind of develop into a beta. Right. So gamma chain. disappears, and then your beta chains come into. That's great. And then if there's a mutation in, let's say, your beta chain, and then that means that that trans that that uh, transformation doesn't happen as it should. Exactly. And then and that causes exactly. sort of issues. Yeah. So, Dr. Shahia, um, when one has, um, how does alpha uh, thalassemia pre present as opposed to like beta? Right. So, so yeah. So there are different uh, shades of alpha thalassemia. Okay. Uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Adil Akhtar mentioned, um, now we classify them as transfusion dependent and right. non-transfusion dependent. So, so the presentations yeah. are mild moderate or severe okay. in, in both both uh, alpha okay. and beta. Okay. So there's a spectrum of the same spectrum on, right. on both types. Right, okay. exactly. Um, so alpha thalassemia can be usually mild because most of uh, people may have a trait or a carrier status mm -hmm. um, and they could have a normal hemoglobin uh, yeah. most of their lifetime or maybe a very mild anemia which is picked up incidentally mm -hmm. on some other uh, you know workup that they're having. Um, so, so they could be pretty asymptomatic for most of of their life yeah. um, but you know in s rare situations uh, you could have a severe form of alpha thalassemia mostly in children mm. Um, mm. and 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 of course the most severest form that we commonly see is the beta major uh, thalassemia okay okay so then in in beta thalassemia then how does that present differently or is it more or less the same symptoms for both well, symptoms can be very similar. It's basically mm -hmm. anemia, which means they have a pale skin. Yes. Um, they may be jaundiced uh, with a yellowness mm -hmm. in their white of the eye. Um, there could be other complications gradually developing, like you know, extended belly or their bones start to get deformed mm -hmm. and widen mm -hmm. in the face, especially. Uh, so, so those could be the severe uh, presentation yes. of uh, uh -huh. beta thalassemia. Um, but you know, again, uh, depending on uh, was, was it a major beta thalassemia or a minor? Mm -hmm. uh, their presentation can be very mild and may not require any, mm -hmm. uh, for example, like transfusion versus severe, yeah. which presents like by six months of life. Oh, so from from what I'm hearing, a lot of this, a lot of thalassemia is should be diagnosed when you're a baby. <clears throat> uh, it's it's not it's never that simple, right? <laughs> you know, in, in a perfect world, you know. Um, huh. 
So in the ideal situation, if it's a very severe mutation, the mm. child should be diagnosed by about three to six months of age. Mm. But luckily, it, not all those children have severe um, thalassemia. Mm. So they may have a mild or moderate uh, form of thalassemia. In that case, the first time they'll present, so th so just like Dr. Sharian mentioned, that usually the symptoms would be pale skin. Mm. In children, they'll fail to eat. And they'll actually start um, uh, something which we call pica, which yes. means that they'll just start eating really odd things, yeah. uh, licking, <laughs> licking, uh, paint uh, licking paint, yeah, chewing eating pencil. mud. Mm. Uh, chewing pencils or stuff like that. Huh. Um, uh, and then gradually, as it gets worse over time, then they actually may present at two years of age for the first time. Ah, so it could be this kind of buildup of symptoms that exactly. get passed off as normal, strange child behavior even. Exactly. But just a lot of kids don't like to eat. A lot of kids don't like to eat and, and some, sometimes mothers worry that maybe, maybe they're just calcium deficient ah. and that's, that's what they're trying to make up for yeah. uh, by yeah. eating these odd, um, uh, odd things. Hmm. Um, but as it gradually goes on, maybe the first time they present is at two years of age. Hmm. Uh, or for that matter, if they come down with a severe infection like bad diarrhea or hmm. bad pneumonia, that's when the hemoglobin all of a sudden really quickly drops. So they may oh. be fine until nine or ten months of age and then all of a sudden they get this bad cold or a pneumonia hmm. and their hemoglobin drops really rapidly and they become very pale, very sick, end up need needing to be hospitalized. And uh, uh, during that period in time, that's when usually they're first diagnosed. Oh, so a very low hemoglobin in a, in a toddler means that one should be sort of one's pediatrician needs to be testing for thalassemia like it's not I wouldn't go that entirely far. normal to have such a low so, hemoglobin so count. if i could just rephrase that a little yes. if uh, um, whenever a child has anemia they need to be uh, it ha the cause has to be identified. It mm. shouldn't be taken for granted that, oh, yes. just because the child's pale, um, he'll get better with food supplements or yeah. something like that. You, know, you, um, you eat enough iron-rich things like exactly. livers and Give you'll be okay. Give him spinach and, and red meat and he'll be fine. Yeah. No, that's not necessarily always the case. Mm. Um, uh, so the best advice would be that if your child is pale, cranky, not eating well, uh, eating uh, listless. Because if you're not or, oxygenated, exactly. you're probably just really Tired exactly. all the time. Exactly. And and in some cases, if, if they're just just poor in school, sometimes it's a good idea to get them checked for anemia. Oh, but then anemia is not the same thing as thalassemia. No. Hmm. Now, anemia uh, or, or a low hemoglobin, the most common cause in children in Pakistan is iron deficiency. Yes. For that matter, right? So the first thing which I would think of if any child presented to me was iron deficiency. But then the second thing I would think about is thalassemia. Hmm. So, Dr. Shahir, what's a normal time to, let's say, be anemic and if you take supplements? And then is there like a time frame in which you should be improving? And then if you don't improve, then you should look at thalassemia. Right, yes, yeah, a very good question. So Thank you. If you're, if, you're a, <laughs> if you're taking an oral iron supplement, for example, if yeah. your doctor said, then you may have iron deficiency, take this oral supplement. Yeah. I would expect to see a response by three to four weeks uh, right. in your you know, hemoglobin mm. levels, provided you're absorbing iron well, assuming there are no issues with the absorption. Mm. Um, so if you're not seeing any increment, um, and also there are other indices in the, in your complete blood profile yeah. that can help you guide whether what type of anemia this is, you know, the size of the red cells. Yes. Um, so there are things that can help you point towards that there could be something else going on. Mm. And you know, nowadays, for example, I usually check iron levels and iron saturation. So I usually know that I'm dealing with iron deficiency anemia uh, at the outset. And that's like a different thing. And also like sickle cell anemia is also not thalassemia. No. Correct. So this is a different form <laughs> like of out of two. <laughs> so, so there are different versions of hemoglobin. As we said, <clears throat> hemoglobin A, which is the yep. adult hemoglobin, he mm. hemoglobin F, which is the baby or baby fetal mm. hemoglobin. So there's hemoglobin S, uh, which is the sickle uh, cell oh, okay. hemoglobin. And, and these hemoglobins are also very unstable and they precipitate like a crescent, like a sickle. Yes. Um, so, so it's a different form of... Okay. Uh, so just sort of good to be sort of clear on the different kinds of iron deficiencies. I feel like we're quite obsessed with iron deficiency also. Now we're like, oh my gosh, and nobody has any iron. <laughs> we're going to take a very quick break and come back to this fascinating conversation. Stay with us. Welcome back 
to the coffee table. We're having a surprisingly interesting conversation about thalassemia. And I'm only saying surprising for your benefit. I'm genuinely really enjoying this conversation. <laughs> so before uh, the break, we were talking about um, thalassemia that is treated with the transfusion and then thalassemia that doesn't require transfusion. So Dr. Shehriyar, what does that mean? Right, so the, those who have a severe form of thalassemia mm -hmm. where their hemoglobin drops precipitously, yes. uh, they need a blood transfusion to support okay. their hemoglobin. Which means that you basically replace their blood with fresh right. they need blood a, with regular hemoglobin. Right, they need a constant renewal or uh, a new blood um, to replace their you know, non-functional RBCs. Mm -hmm. And we know that there is a certain life of those RBCs. So yes. uh, we say about 120 days. Okay. Uh, it could be shorter. Uh, if it's not fresh blood, for example. So there is an ongoing need in these people and uh, and then they need to be managed uh, properly, you know, uh, with iron chelation mm. as well. And, yeah. Oh, iron chelation, what's that? Uh, can, I, well, can I add uh, just about the blood? Yes, I mean, please do. Just an important point. Remember, it's not whole blood which they need. Right. Oh. They should only get the red blood cells. Oh. If thalassemics are given whole blood, huh. that can result in disastrous complications. Oh, gosh. So, a very important point to mm. keep in mind is uh, all these thalassemic patients who will need blood uh, repeatedly mm. should only be getting red blood cells. Oh, so the, and the rest of the blood can, mm. can right. benefit someone else. So, the distinction is there's not blood as everything, it's, it's you need the hemoglobin from the blood, you sort of separate that. Yeah, and the then red you, blood cells. From huh. the, right, the packed red blood cells. Yeah. Um, and the plasma and the platelets are separated out. Yes. Uh, and you just, so that, you know, conserves, uh, you know, volume also. Yeah. Hmm. Um, you know, there are antibodies which uh, patients develop. If you get repeated transfusions, yeah. uh, sometimes there are antibodies which reject those uh, red oh. cells. Mm -hmm. So in order to minimize that chance of happening, mm. you need to have, uh, you know, just strictly those red blood cells, avoid any... Uh, uh, we use some filters sometimes, yeah. le leukocyte filters, which filter out the white cells, which are the mm -hmm. culprits, mm -hmm. which yeah. introduce or develop uh, those antibodies. Uh, uh. So, so yeah, I think uh, I just want to underscore the point that yes. yes, it has to be just the packed red blood cells. So is it sort of, now again, this I think now naturally takes me to blood banks. Mm -hmm. So do we have enough blood in blood banks to be able to do all of this? We don't have enough blood. Hmm. Let me just put that right out there. I mean, we hear whenever there's a bomb blast or a calamity mm -hmm. or, or yeah. for example, when there was an earthquake back yes. in 2005, uh, many people rush to donate blood yeah. because they feel it's their moral responsibility, yes, and moral and social responsibility. Huh, and it's, a, it's a really sort of definite way in which you can help. Exactly. But what happens is once that calamity is over, everyone forgets. Oh. And then, and then we have difficulty in getting blood for our, our patients, and mm. I'm sure that's vice versa for mm -hmm. the oncology patients uh, during Ramadan. Yeah. During this COVID season, yeah. it's been it's been very difficult. Um, but one thing we have to realize is number one, fifty more than fifty percent of our population in Pakistan is youth. Yeah. It, it's young, healthy people. Um, and, and if they actually go out and just on a regular basis, mm. every three months, someone can donate blood. I'm surprised. I thought that our blood banks would be full of blood, you know, and everybody's no, sort of going out and doing it, but I, that's I, not I, the case. I, no, I keep on preaching that, you know, what's really important is us to realize that if if even less than half of our population, half of our youth population yeah. actually goes in just as a as a regular basis, as a moral responsibility, yeah. donates blood yeah. on their birthday. Or, or just to celebrate the fact that they've had a healthy previous year Quite right. and they're looking forward to another healthy previous year, uh, next year. Yes. Um, just imagine that the amount of blood we would have. Wow. And then we wouldn't necessarily have to ask relatives to arrange for mm -hmm. blood uh, mm -hmm. when needed for surgeries or for emergency procedures. And we wouldn't have, have to have uh, um, uh, people rushing in when calamities happen. Because Quite keep right. in mind, when we uh. store blood, blood can only be stored for a certain amount of time. Oh, further complications. And then you have to get rid of it. Oh, gosh. So, and then it would be so, con it sort of makes so much sense that if you separate the hemoglobin for the thalassemic and then the platelets go to the oncologists and everybody can use it and exactly. that would be amazing. So, so if you just think about it, one, one unit or one yeah. bag of blood can actually save three people's lives. <gasps> So, That's astounding. So if, if one person donates one mm. bag of blood, he's actually going out and saving three individuals' lives. Wow. So just imagine, I mean, 
how that's motivating tremendous. that is. That's tremendous. You have an opportunity to save three people. Three people. Right. That's yeah. enormous. That's massive. Absolutely. So if you're sort of cycling back now to, to thalassemia, so the other, the non-transfusionable thalassemia treatment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just yeah. a lay person. Oh, no, you, yeah, that's pretty good, actually. That's pretty good. Non-transfusion dependent mm. uh, thalassemia. Yeah. yeah. So those are those patients who, um, so normally those tra transfusion dependent people need to get blood transfused every month. Yes. Okay. Um, Non-transfusion dependent patients with the help of some drugs may need to get transfused once in six months. Hmm. or once in three months, okay. depending upon how old they are and mm -hmm. how big they are and et cetera, uh, and how healthy they stay. Um, but they come with their own set of problems, mm -hmm. but it's easier to manage them at times. Oh, okay. Than the severe. All right. So the ones who are non-transfusion dependent, which means they do need transfusions, but yes. not at the same regularity exactly. as transfusion dependent ones, right. they still need transfusions, but they can go longer between transfusions. Yes. Because they, either it's because the nature of their disease, they're on, you know, because it's, it's the spectrum. severity of the gene mutation. Huh. Right. And also drugs. And uh, with the help of drugs. Right. right. So what kind of drugs, what do the drugs do to manage thalassemia? Um, the, the drugs, there's, there's drugs which do two different things. Yeah. So one drug actually stabilizes uh, the uh, alpha globin chain, mm -hmm. not letting it precipitate, right. like Dr. Sheryad mentioned. Mm -hmm. And the other actually brings back the um, gamma chain so that you don't have to be dependent upon your beta chain. Wow. I love science. So it sounds like <laughs> magic, you know. It's just like so, let me bring back this childhood right. <laughs> chain. So to if help you think you about it, this child is has beta thalassemia because yeah. he has a, he's dependent upon the beta chain. Yeah. But let's let's get Bypass. rid of his dependence yeah. on the beta chain and bring back that gamma chain which he was born with. Yeah. And how do we work around that? So that's what the drugs do in the simplest terms. That's Really, like it sounds like magic to me. It really does. Like you know, just kind of magic it out of your body and be like, yeah, let's just bypass this faulty beta chain and be like, you know, here's this nice gap. Yeah, wow. So, yeah, I'm sort of <laughs> sitting with it for a moment. I and mean, that's like miraculous. Right. This is why I love science, really. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dr. Shahiyar, I sort of I want you both of you to explain how. Um, one can be a carrier for thalassemia, which means you don't actually have it, but you have the gene for it. Mm -hmm. And like Dr. Axter mentioned, you always have two. Every genes are in pairs, right? So you have one gene is, I presume, then recessive. So you have like a recessive thalassemic gene. And then there are people who have thalassemia like properly, whether it's mild or major, you have it. Like mm -hmm. you've been diagnosed. So how does that work? How does that happen? I think you kind of answered in your uh, question. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> to some extent, uh, I'll just elaborate it further. Must be a genius. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two genes, um, or alleles as we call them, yes. partners, and they are on each arm of mm -hmm. the chromosome. So you need to have uh, both uh, hits on both sides to have a full-blown mm -hmm. disease status. Yeah. If one is normal and the other is diseased or deficient, uh, then the normal part will compensate for yeah. that and it'll give you a milder version or maybe a normal uh, version of your hemoglobin. Oh, okay. So, so those are the carriers because they do have one defective gene that they can pass on to their progeny or the mm. children. Mm. Uh, so th that's what carried or trait means. Uh, okay. But if you have both uh, bad genes, then um, unfortunately you have the disease mm. Uh, mm. itself. So Dr. Akhtar, is it possible to be a carrier and not know it? Oh, absolutely. Hmm. Um, so if, if you think about it in Pakistan, when we talk about the gene frequency of thalassemia being 5 to 7 percent, hmm. um, uh, in a very simplified manner, what that means, if you have 100 people sitting in a room, hmm. probably 5 to 7 percent have at least one affected gene. Mm, okay. Right? Mm. But since that it's just one affected gene, yes. and we, we have two, yeah. uh, and I, I always believe it's like the good versus bad, so <laughs> good always dominates yeah, against bad. <laughs> um, the Jedi win. <laughs> right. So, so basically what that means is they won't have any symptoms. Yeah. Um, the only time they may actually realize that they, mm. they or, or, or go for a test which will help them diagnose whether they're a carrier or not is during stressed Episodes, for example, if they're going for surgery, mm. 
Okay. Uh, or if uh, a, a young woman who's going, uh, having a pregnancy. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a stress on her body, there's a stress on anyone's body while they're going for surgery or a severe illness. Mm -hmm. That's when they may have a drop in their hemoglobin and someone may get a test ordered and actually look at it in more detail that, well, why is this person anemic? And then for the, oh, oh wow, I'm actually thalassemic carrier. Oh, so it is actually really possible that a lot of people in Pakistan think they're anemic, but they're exactly. actually thalassemic. Yes. And because they don't know they are, then they're obviously they're not having, let's say, you know, gene genetic counseling or prenatal screening because like you don't know you have this gene. Right. And then sort of what are, so if this is the case, let's say, how likely is it that you will pass on that defective gene to your child? So that depends upon who you get married to. Mm. Right? Yeah. So if, if I'm going to take the example of myself, let's suppose I'm a carrier. I'm a thalassemia carrier, right? If my wife is normal, mm. then the, I'll pass on the gene, but it, I'll pass on the, the likelihood in every pregnancy or every child we have that there's a one in four chance okay. that that child may be a carrier. Mm -hmm. The chance of that child actually being a thalassemic patient is yeah. zero. Oh, so you can have the gene, but it's okay because but you won't okay. get the disease. You'll be fine. Right. And then you could in turn, then that child, when they become an adult, could pass it on, maybe. Yeah. And then their child would technically be okay. Yeah, absolutely. So hmm. um, again, going back to the thing that if, if my wife was also absolutely normal. Yeah. If my wife was also a carrier, hmm. so I'm a carrier and my wife's a carrier, now there's an, a chance that these two affected yep. genes yes. will, form will, a pair. will form a pair mm. in one of our, in, in and a child. And one in four. And in each mm. pregnancy, it's one in four. Yes. Right. So sometimes what people confuse, oh, okay, it's one in four, that means if I have four children, <laughs> only one of them, but that's, that's not how it works. Right. Um, that's a bad kind of lottery. <laughs> <laughs> that's not how it works, but um, basically what it means that you have a 25% chance in each pregnancy to have a thalassemia patient if the two Mm, uh, the mm. spouses are actually uh, carriers, carriers, both of them. Right. But Dr. Shaya, is a 25% chance of contracting thalassemia, is that sort of, compared to other diseases, are those odds significantly high or is it just kind of more or less mm. the same as getting many other things potentially? I think 25% is a big number, mm. um, uh, you know, especially in the context that both are carriers mm -hmm. um, and I think one in four would I would put it a higher percentage compared mm -hmm. to other mm -hmm. uh, okay. diseases mm -hmm. um, so it is definitely something to consider right absolutely yeah like for example we say for breast cancer one in eight women will develop a cancer yes. and you know we are very concerned yes. about this yes. problem so one in four so is one in four is you know it, it's significant I think yeah. yeah yeah so does it mean that now if one is anemic one should get screened for thalassemia is it sensible for people to kind of now find out. Right. I, I think again, as Dr. Akhtar also said, that not everybody needs right off the bat full-blown mm. screening and testing for thalassemia, but you need to start with a detailed history, family history, mm. um, you know, basic blood tests, uh, and then, uh, you know, decide whether you need to do more specialized testing, mm. like testing for thalassemia. Yeah. Um, mm. So I would take it on a case by case basis. Mm. I don't think there's a one size fits all kind of approach for every anemic that walks into your clinic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how I would approach it. Mm. So there's no need to kind of panic about no, it no, either. Not at all. And if you're, there's no family history of thalassemia, nobody has it no. in within a few generations, then your your anemia is probably just anemia. So I, I would eat agree livers. with uh, uh, Dr. Shariad. Um, you need a step by step approach. Mm. Mm. So you first think of the things which are most common. So you yeah. would think about something like if it's maybe a nutritional deficiency, right. and you would first look at that. Um, many times people need to realize that there's, although I would love to know immediately what's going to happen to me 10 years down the road, yeah. but um, there's no rush to know yeah. whether you're a thalassemia carrier or not, right? But why? The reason why is you want to know first so when I mean rush, that's relative. Yeah. No. Uh, so maybe in the next three months, yes, mm -hmm. I would like to know. Yeah. But today, um, if I'm anemic, 
I want to know why. So my yeah. doctor may not necessarily just first think, oh, well, the most common is iron deficiency or nutritional. Mm. So let's first do that, yeah. put yeah. you on some medication, see if you respond mm. well. Like and if you, said, you, you know, do, four weeks, you're okay, right, exactly. then you're probably and if you're, fine. And if you're fine, then yeah. we'll, we'll, well and good, we'll put that chapter closed mm. sort mm. of situation. But if it doesn't respond, then yeah. yes. Yeah. Then that's and the next then step. Then that's the next step. Okay, so, so no actually need to testing kind of... for thalassemia, mm. if you don't have a history yeah. or a family history, of um, other people in your uh, family with either a carrier status or a thalassemia patient for that matter, or someone who has passed away because of anemia, uh, then uh, yeah. Oh, right. passing away because of anemia, that's probably not that anemia. Especially in, mm. especially mm. in children. Uh, more questions, we're going to take a very quick break because you know, I'm dying to ask the questions and stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to the coffee table and this fascinating conversation on thalassemia that we're having with Dr. Adil Akhtar and Dr. Hassan Shehriyar. So, there are lots of questions that I still want to ask. So, I'm going to sort of whack them off in a rapid fire nerd round. <laughs> no, just joking. So, Dr. Shehriyar, we talked about iron chelation. Now, what is that? Right, so, um, you know, we know that these patients require blood transfusions yeah. on a very regular basis, the yeah. transfusion dependent types one. Hmm. So what happens is that in each uh, unit of blood, say it's about 200 mLs, hmm. there's about 200 milligrams of iron also in okay. that because hemoglobin is composed of not just those alpha beta globin but also mm. the iron part yeah. the heme part so over time as you can imagine if somebody is getting blood transfusion frequently mm. um, they will get uh, they're getting 200 milligrams of iron with each unit every time uh -huh. and it sort of uh, leads to an excess of iron in the body oh. and uh, the way it works is that our body cannot clear the iron if it is in excess it's, okay. It ends up being stored in different organs. Which is not good news. Because... Which is not good. <laughs> and, you know, commonly the liver, um, heart, and like pancreas. Mm. Uh, these are the organs which uh, accumulate iron more, and then there is a uh, inflammatory reaction to the presence of iron, mm. and eventually, you know, there is a uh, defect in the function of this uh, organs uh -huh. so so basically that what what you need is that you need to remove excess iron we From need we need the red cells uh -huh. but we need to take out the extra iron that oh, is coming so transfusion with. is actually a very delicate for thalassemia is a very sort of delicate balance here yeah, where absolutely. then we have to kind of manage all of these things and then i believe that there are other sort of symptoms that happen to thalassemics if th their thalassemia isn't treated properly and one of them is that your bone marrow sort of expands and your bones become deformed. Right. But why is that? Like, tell me about the bone marrow. Right. So, so normally the iron is formed in the bone marrow. If, okay. if, if the formation is normal, that you have a good, healthy red cells coming out, um, the body is not going into an overdrive hmm. to produce more. Yeah. What happens is that when we have these abnormal uh, red cells, hmm. body feels that there is not enough. Uh, red cells in the body. Mm -hmm. These there are red cells, but they are not functioning. Yeah. So the feedback mechanisms are sensing as if there is no red cell. So mm. it signals the bone marrow to make more uh, red cells, which are in turn more defective. Bone marrow makes red cells. Right. Ah, right. not livers. Uh, right. So liver is not uh, under normal circumstances. Mm. Liver will not be making a, a yeah. red cell. So then, because the bone marrow is then essentially working overtime, it's sort of expanding, and then it happens through the spleen also right so spleen usually clears out the old uh, you know uh, red cells from the body yes uh, but uh, in patients with thalassemia uh, it, it, at a point reaches where it starts to eat up on even good uh, red cells white cells platelets oh god and, and it, it becomes like a sponge spleen is like cleaned everything away right so it becomes like a sponge oh. and it just keeps on expanding and expanding and the belly becomes really big it oh, becomes very that's painful why it becomes distended yeah. Right. Oh, so it's a yeah. painful situation at some point. Plus, it's eating up on your good cells, mm -hmm. white cells, and platelets as well. So we used to recommend uh, removal of the spleen in those cases. Yeah. Um, so not everyone needs it, but some, some patients may need it. So, so now that I've suitably like terrified the audience with all of these things, mm -hmm. Dr. Akhtar, I think that when we were talking about this before also, is that thalassemia is 
is a disease that can be managed yeah. in a way that is effective and you can have a perfectly normal, healthy life. And, you know, we talked about pa passing it on to your children, which seems also, you know, it's like if you're aware of that and if you're aware of your condition, then you can have the added sort of counseling and you can have, you can get the advice that you need to be able to plan a family, which is also part of a lot of people's sort of, Absolutely. you know, idea of a normal life. But you can also work and you can, you know, do whatever you like. Absolutely. So, and then in your work with the Thalassemia Federation, do you feel like uh, thalassemia still, there are a lot of, there are sort of stigmas or myths around thalassemia that need to be addressed? <clears throat> I, um, there's a lot which needs to be addressed, yeah. but at the same time, there's a lot of good which is happening. So hmm. we, we are now uh, having many of our thalassemia children who are growing up, getting married, hmm. uh, living normal, healthy lives. Yeah. Some are doctors, some are um, uh, uh, working and uh, uh, supporting their families. Hmm. So there's a lot of good which is happening. And, and just, just taking it one step back, the way we do it is exactly what we're talking about. We take care of, we give them the blood they require. Yeah how much they require. We make sure that the extra iron is gotten rid of, mm. and we make sure they, that they're healthy just like any one of us, yeah. and they live normal, healthy lives. Mm. Mm. The problem why we're having so much difficulty is that it's expensive. Oh. The drugs which are used mm. to remove iron from the body are expensive drugs. Mm. And then we just previously talked about the blood shortage which we yes. do face. So, What's happening is the majority of the children are not getting enough blood, which mm. the blood which they require, and then they may not necessarily be getting safe blood. That's a whole oh. different issue. Mm. And this, at the same time, they can't, they don't have access to many of the drugs because they're expensive. Oh, and that's where the whole we we sort of lose that balance, mm. Uh, mm. which is required for a healthy life. At the same time. Uh, there's tremendous opportunities. Um, there's the Punjab Thalassemia uh, Prevention Program, which okay. is doing a lot of good mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in really providing free service for anyone who wants to get tested, mm. uh, whether they're a thalassemia carrier or not. Or not. Uh, at the same time, helping uh, providing facilities for counseling. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as, as well as uh, prevention as sort. And their right. main focus is actually prevention. Uh, what I primarily focus is on the treatment of thalassemic patients. Mm. So I think treatment and prevention sort of go hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, you have to take care of those thalassemics who are uh, around us. Who already have it. Who already mm -hmm. have it for mm -hmm. no fault of their own. Yes. Uh, at the same time, you have to try to prevent uh, new thalassemics being mm. born. So Dr. Shahriyar, how do we, how does one prevent it? Like, like Dr. said, how do, you, how do you prevent a genetically transferred disease? Right, so I think um, currently, um, from what we have available, uh, the best strategy is to use a prenatal counseling. Hmm. Um, so in families where there is thalassemia, huh. um, when individuals from those family are you know, planning to get married, hmm. uh, they need to consult their uh, gynecologist or a referral to a specialist hmm. uh, who deals with thalassemia. Um, to you know, discuss and you know, do those tests so, yeah. so avoid having a carrier marrying mm. a carrier. Uh, mm. That would be the easiest way to prevent it. Yes. I mean, there are some novel experimental, uh, mm. I think, options coming up, but they're not uh, prime time yet, uh, yeah. like gene therapy, where they will actually remove the defective gene and uh, with some special you know, technology, they'll insert the normal one. And wow. yeah. so, so I think, science. So, <laughs> so yeah, the Frankenstein or yeah. <laughs> whatever it. you want to call it. that. Uh, yeah, but it's, that's not really an option for, let's say, Pakistani families. Correct. So it's yeah. really important to be honest about your medical history with whoever you are planning to marry or whichever community you're now going to be a part of. But Dr. Akhtar, would it also be does it make it worse if you keep marrying within a family or within a community? Does that make your sort of does that increase your chances of getting a genetically trans transmitted disease like thalassemia? The simple answer, well, I'm going to go to the first part and hold on <laughs> to the thalassemia for the second for a minute. But the first part, yes, it does. Yes. It does increase the uh, risk of uh, your children developing mm. a genetic disease. But does that mean that we shouldn't, um, uh, we, we should actually ban marriages uh, for keeping thalassemia in mind? No. Hmm. And I'll tell you my, my thought process on that, and yeah. Dr. Shadiak can pitch in. Hmm. Uh, but it, it's the whole idea that 
Um, when we say in Pakistan, uh, thalassemia has a gene frequency of five to seven yes. percent. That's that's not a homogenous spread across the country. These oh. are small pockets oh. uh, of, Com so, of communities hmm. which which do have uh, thalassemia in in those communities. Oh, so, so and then there'll be large pockets huh. which probably don't have thalassemia at all. Oh. Ah, and okay. never really need to be tested for hmm. that matter. Hmm. So um, keeping it in that small community hmm. um, helps us, if we know where that community is, we can target our resources and our awareness hmm. programs hmm. and our hmm. testing and our counseling and all, all what's required yeah. for prevention to that specific area. And you could probably... Uh, handle it better. Hmm. Whereas if you encourage people to marry outside of their families specific for thalassemia, yes. what's happening is that small circle will become larger and then larger oh. because you're marrying oh. outside and it will become larger. And then you, you're risking it being spread all across Pakistan. Huh. Um, with a population of already, I even forget the numbers, but 220 million or 230 million <laughs> getting there. Many millions. <laughs> but many millions. <laughs> many millions. Um, and, 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 then, and then it's going to just go out of hand. When we think oh. about those countries like Cyprus, or we talk about other countries who have actually eradicated thalassemia with specific prevention programs alone, mm. you have to also consider that they're very small, confined populations. I mean, oh, the whole population okay. of Cyprus is hardly 18 million. Hmm. Right, and and then you look at the resources they have available That's for true. that eighteen million. Quite right, Doctor Shah. Do you feel like you know it's not a question of not having policy, but it's more a question of directing that those whatever funds we have, then right. to sort of maximize the potential. Right. Yeah. I think uh, we first have to recognize our own unique situation, yeah. which Doctor Akhtar just mentioned, mm. that we have a non-randomized uh, thalassemia gene distribution in our population. So we have clusters of family, it's not homogeneously. So a screening program is not the best way of utilizing mm. your funds. It's not going to be cost effective yeah. or give the results. Because genes. everybody doesn't need it. Only those communities should have it. C correct. Right. And then we need to identify those communities and provide them the education. They should be aware of their risks mm. and benefits of, mm. uh, you know, inter uh, community marriages. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. Nobody can ban the marriages. Yeah. Um, uh, I think they just need to be cognizant of the risks they might have for mm. their children and then make the best decision in consultation with their doctor. Again, it will be a case to case mm. discussion. I don't think we can have a, a one flat policy for, right. for everybody. Yeah. Uh, but but but, you know, having said that, we do need to have, uh, I feel, uh, a technical advisory group uh, mm -hmm. advising the government to yeah. develop a national thalassemia policy. Mm -hmm. And it, it should include all the stakeholders that we have, uh, the NGOs and the government. Yes. Uh, and then see how best we can serve our and population. And in a way, it sounds like it shouldn't be too difficult. Now, I'm again simplifying it grossly. Because if we, again, I, we, ha we know that these are the communities that need, uh, you know, education and awareness building first then we can just start there and then sort of move on but again in a positive way and thalass a, a thalassemic exactly. diagnosis doesn't mean that this is the end of you know your life as a healthy person I mean actually using targeted um, uh, targeted approaches is always more cost effective hmm. and if we think about the cost you would invest into actually first finding those families it's worth the cost. Yes. Uh, uh, like most of the time in Pakistan, we 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 uh, we suffer from a lack of facts and figures. Yes. Right. So uh, so yeah. I mean, yeah. if today we want to know exactly how much of our population has a specific disease exactly, exactly. Hmm. we don't know. We don't, and then we can't and, then decide and how then many blood banks are needed. And thank you so much, doctors, for being on the show. It's, it's a, a fascinating a conversation which I have enjoyed thoroughly from you know spleens and whatnot. <laughs> thank you guys for watching. If you're watching this. YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe and remember that a thalassemic diagnosis is something that you can, you know, it can be managed, there are solutions and um, yeah, stay safe, be healthy. We'll see you next time. Bye.